Lemon. I'm the Dean of the College of Culinary Arts, and uh, we are thrilled today to have uh, David Kinch as our guest for an informal Q&A. And you can tell it's informal because it's exciting, right? Nothing? Nothing? Is this on? Okay. So we're very, very happy uh, and pleased to have uh, David here today. Is that comfortable? Yes, very much. Okay. Okay. So. Like so I want to. Can you hear me? <laughs> can you all hear? All right. So I want to do a little. You have a bio, uh, David's bio on, on your on your seat. I just want to do a couple of things uh, before we get started. Number one, please make sure your cell phones are silenced at this point. Thank you. Um, I want to give you a quick background, and the first thing I want to do is we're going to talk about uh, uh, a Michelin star. For those folks who know something about the Michelin Guide, raise your hand. Very good, very good. So you know that one Michelin star means that it's a very, very good restaurant. You know that if it's two Michelin stars, it's a restaurant worth making a separate trip or a detour, as they say in France. And then third Michelin star represents a, a restaurant that you make a special journey to go to today. So I want you to keep that in mind as we, as we read about David and talk about his uh, voyage. I want you to know that he graduated from Johnson Wales in 1981. He moved to New York City. Worked at the Parker Meridian and La Petite Terme at a time when French restaurants really dominated uh, the New York restaurant scene. And in 1984, he left for France uh, for the Hotel de la Poste in Bonn, which is in the heart of the Burgundy region. Returning to New York, uh, David landed the Club of Giraffe, which was the preeminent restaurant in New York in the 1980s. I ran into Barry Wine about two weeks ago. Uh, no, two months ago, sorry. And I said hello. In New York. Uh, in New York, yes. Uh, he's uh, retired now, but he's still can um, create a storm wherever he goes. Yes. He's very, he's very, very good at that. And I went up to him and I, I said hello, and I said, you know, um, I, I, I met you many, many years ago back in New York in the 1980s, and he said, oh my God, did I turn you down for a job? And I said, well, no, I didn't have the guts to ask you if the restaurant was that good. Uh, is that your memory as well? Uh, when, I, when I first came back from France and I was looking for work, uh, this was the end of 83, 84, uh, uh, the end of 84, looking for work, uh, uh, how you went and looked for a job is you, you know, printed resumes, you went someplace you could print a resume that you typed out on a typewriter, and you would go and walk around, you go into the front door. And, uh, I landed in New York, I printed up 40 resumes, and I walked around, and I think I am 39 out, to all the various French restaurants in town, you know, Midtown, Manhattan, all the all the places that kind of dominated the scene right then. And I hadn't even intended to go to the Quilted, but walking back to uh, the room where I was staying at, I actually ended up right in front of the Quilted Giraffe, and I had one more resume. And I, you know, I, I said, what the heck? <coughs> and I knocked on the door, and there was one guy in there vacuuming the door, and it was Barry. Barry Barry's vacuuming. And he said, well, you know, you're actually kind of in luck. You just had a long-time employee just leave. And why don't you come in uh, on Monday and try out? I ended up spending five years. <laughs> Forced to stay with the bold. Yeah. I, I think there's, a, there's quite a bit uh, to that knocking on the door thing. Uh, I, I experienced that myself. And I, I know I, I bothered in 1983, 1984, I bothered the young chef named Thomas Teller until he would give me a job. And I did the same thing. I typed up my resume. I walked around Manhattan. My car came out, and I just kept bugging him. And he would not. He was too busy. You bug, yeah, you bug people. They know that you know that that you're really interested. In this. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we throw our hair up in the air and say, you know, they email us 15 times now. Okay, at least uh, maybe have them come in for a trial. Is that it? Yeah, I I, can, I remember calling him uh, on the phone from a phone booth. If you know what that is, from a phone booth out right outside the restaurant. And I said, just give me a shot. Just give me a shot. He said, all right, come in. Where are you? I was like, in the phone booth in the lobby. So let me in. Um, and, and so, but that and persistence, <laughs> persistent favor, persistence is a good thing. Uh, back to back to David, not me. Uh, after a stint at a winery in Northern California, and something we share in common, David was off to Japan, back to San Francisco, including at the legendary Ernie's in the financial district, and then back to Europe. This is a fascinating story. Uh, two years in Germany, Spain, and France, including a three Michelin star uh, property in Burgundy. Was that the thing that, working at that three star restaurant, was that the thing that made it a uh, long term hold for you? Well, um, staging and going to work at different places, you, 
you wanted to learn, you wanted to experience different ways. This was the second time that I was staging. I was I was 30 years old at this time. I had worked, I had run some management level positions in kitchens at that time, but I didn't really feel that I was finished, ready to go to the next level. And uh, I had been working in San Francisco when we were hit with the big earthquake in 1989. And uh, it essentially closed the city down, closed the industry down for at least six months. And it was a great opportunity to step away and perhaps revisit an opportunity to stage in places where I could regard it as almost as a finishing school. And uh, my goal then, too, was to work in the best kitchens I could possibly find and uh, and tend to be the one who mentioned the stars. Outstanding. And I just want to interject here. If you do have a question for the chef, just raise your hand, just like school. Um, it's not formal. And the first person is in trouble. <laughs> uh, but just raise your hand and we'll, we'll pause. Okay, so back from France, uh, back to California. And you opened a bistro in Santa Clara, is that correct? Uh, yes, I came back and uh, 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 it was a small place in Saratoga. I came and I worked a job. Uh, I actually came back and worked at Ernie's after coming back from Europe. I see. And, uh, and I was ready to open up a new place. I looked, I wanted to open something <laughs> small and cook very, very simply. And I spent about a year looking at places, mostly places I couldn't afford. It was really on a a shoestring budget, and uh, uh, I ended up finding a place down in Saratoga, which is in what's known as the South Bay, about an hour south of San Francisco, uh, and it's in the same town where the winery I'd worked at, so I was down visiting them, and uh, I happened to have come across this little restaurant that was for sale, and uh, that was our start there. Our rent was $1,200 a month <laughs> for, for the restaurant I could afford to have. <laughs> Uh, that seems almost impossible now uh, that you find anything that's $1,200 a month, ever. Uh, carport. Yeah, carport, that would be, that would be yeah. your best. Uh, and then seven years later, you, you moved to Man Racer. Now that was certainly shifting philosophy towards food. Uh, what, what prompted you to make that, that step? Well, uh, the first restaurant, it was, it was called Sensovi. Sensovi, it, 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 was, uh, it was busy from the start. We were very, very lucky. There was only 30 seats. And uh, we were busy, but the kitchen was about the size of the room closet. It was very, very tiny. And after seven and a half years, we felt really limited by, by the space, uh, by the kitchen. There really wasn't much room to grow or to expand what we had. Uh, so we had our eyes open for spaces. And we found uh, a space down the road in Los Gatos, current space where we are now, uh, about five, minutes, five miles down the road. And um, um, we put together a partnership, raised some money, and and took the place over. It was a different name and a different location, but essentially it was the same restaurant. We, we picked up the staff and, and relocated. And we, the, the relocation put us in a place we were given the opportunity to build the kitchen that we wanted, and uh, so we really weren't going to be limited by space or by equipment, that sort of thing. And that's, yeah, that's what we were looking for. And, and what was it, what was the kitchen that you wanted? Uh, it was, uh, it had room, every station, every s dedicated station in the kitchen had uh, refrigeration, uh, counter space, uh, uh, a water source, uh, access to heat, <coughs> and uh, remarkably so, we had a lot of windows too, so we had a lot of natural light, which it, it wasn't like a basement kitchen with hideous fluorescent lighting that makes everybody look like Skeletor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that must, there must have been some, sh was there a shift in the, your philosophy uh, towards food uh, that made you want to move, or was it strictly real estate, or? No, I mean, we were always ambitious, you know, we always wanted to be the best cooks we could possibly be and offer the best experience to the guests that we possibly could, and I think after seven and a half years at the old place, we took it as far as we could go, and we needed to, to find a different, create a different situation for ourselves. Uh, and Manresa, we turned 15 years old next year. Manresa has changed a lot in the 15 years. You know, we, we've gone through two renovations. We expanded, we built a dining room, uh, we changed the entryway, we, uh, we added a bar and lounge to it. And then we first opened up, we only had a beer and wine license. And, um, you know, uh, it's one thing to cook, but to run a business and understand the cash flow and revenues, you know, to have a full bar. Was, was a huge difference. You know, when, when that opened, when that happened uh, six years ago, the difference on the bottom line was, was, was 
Does it have to bring on additional uh, management uh, or accounting capability? Uh, yes, very much so. Very much so. And of course, you know, you know the, the, the restrictions of the state and how the state you know, monitors that sort of thing. So it's both liberating and uh, constraining. Yeah, I mean, it allows us, you know, you know, every decision we make at the restaurant, we view it through the prism of, you know, the guest experience. And, uh, you know, is, does this enhance the guest experience? Does it make it a more worthy time? Is, is, does it add to, to their ability to come to the restaurant and enjoy themselves? And are you a man who enjoys a cocktail? Uh, on occasion, yes. Well, then it's good to have a bar right there. Yeah. Isn't it? You know, they didn't have to go too far. Um, okay. So uh, as you're moving from this uh, um, one location to the other, you're moving off, you want to be the best person you could be, you want to express food in a way that was special. You had this uh, long history of experience working in, di in different sectors of the uh, business, but always with a fine dining experience. Yes, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm in this business, I, I became a cook because I loved cooking. You know, uh, when, when I was young, and I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. Uh, I worked jobs uh, during school, on weekends, at nights, during the summer, and I gravitated towards restaurants because you know the hours were flexible. You know, people needed uh, people needed help on the weekends, and you know I first started in the dining room um, because the hours were flexible and you could make a little bit of money for a high school student. <laughs> but I found myself fascinated by what was going on in the kitchen. You know, uh, you know, I would go through the door into the. There was this. There was this group of you know. Profane pirates, you know, working with fire, and uh, you know, loud and noisy and just chaotic. But because I was working in the dining room, you know, I'd go through these doors into the dining room, and all of a sudden it was quiet and it was civilized, and people were enjoying themselves. And I saw. What they were creating in the kitchen was creating this 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 conviviality, this this, uh, this this happiness in the dining room, and I was fascinated by that. I was, you know, because uh, I was I was curious. Um, I felt that I was creative, um, and when I started to cook, when I first took my when I took my first job, I fell in love with it immediately in the kitchen because I was working with my hands. Um, all the problems you have as a young kid, you know, you're growing up, you're a teenager, you're becoming an adult, and there's a lot of issues that go on that, you know, we all experience, but cooking was my therapy. Working with my hands gave me a certain sense of satisfaction. It satisfied me physically. I was tired after work. It was creative, and I was making people happy. There was, I was getting a sense of satisfaction. It wasn't like working on a project and getting satisfaction three months down the road. Every night, it's like, you know, if you're an actor, you know, you do a good show, people love you and they applaud. If you don't do a good job, people let you know about it. And, you know, if you take that as an incentive to be a better cook, then that's the way it is. And that's what I fell in love with. I fell in love with the act of cooking. I didn't fall in love with the industry. Mm -hmm. I still have problems with the industry. Uh, the reason why I do what I do is because I still love to cook. I still love going to work every day. <laughs> I'm going through the act of making guests happy. It's really the most important thing. So what would you say then are, are some of the challenges in the industry that need to be worked on and resolved by, by this next generation? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's hard dealing with the public. You know, it's, uh, everybody has an opinion, everybody has a perception, and uh, you're not gonna please everybody. And, you know, we're in the service industry. You know, we, we serve others and, uh, it's a continually changing battle. Trends come and go. Mm -hmm. People's perceptions come and go. I mean, the difference in dietary restrictions and allergies, you know, in 10, 15 years, the way people eat, 10 or 15 years, the, <laughs> the way people eat on the East Coast and the way people eat on the West Coast are two really entirely different animals. It's pretty astonishing. So it, it's a lot of it is how you adjust. Something I've learned, uh, I, I don't want to fly in the face of of, of curriculum or anything like this, but okay. but you know we were always taught back then that the customer is always right, and I completely disagree with that. I completely disagree with that. 
What is 100% right is the customer's perception. The customer's perception is always right. You can create and you can control the guest's perception of their experience at your, your cafe, your restaurant, your bakery, your hotel. They don't have to be right, but if they feel they're right, then you've done your job. You know, it's like, uh, you know, what gives me great joy is like someone who doesn't eat sea urchin or doesn't eat <coughs> lamb. And you convince them, you know, we dedicate our life to creating the experience that is pleasurable. Why don't you let us drive on this one and see what happens? And if they have a great time and we change their perception, then we can get done our job. We have, yeah. a, we have a question. Oh, we do. No, please. I just want to address my name is Austin Viziri and uh, back on your note on uh, when you established your love for cooking when you were working in the front of the house and you said that they looked like these uh, these pyro pirates and um, I just want to address when you were a student at Johnson Love and you finally arrived at these uh, the industrial facilities how did you feel like passion wise um, could you see yourself then becoming chef of the year and then owning men race like in other words did you already know you wanted this for yourself or were these essential dream that you established throughout your experience? Okay. Well, you know, I, I came to, you know, I was, I grew up in New Orleans, um, uh, which fascinating food culture uh, and restaurant culture. Uh, it, it's very much like Europe in that people talk about what they're going to, they talk about what they're going to have for dinner while they're eating lunch. You know, food is, is ingrained into their, their daily lives. And, and uh, I really loved that. But after getting a taste for cooking in New Orleans, I realized I didn't want to be working in New Orleans. You know, I found my love for cooking there. There was a saying back then, uh, and it's changed, but it used to be, they said, New Orleans was a town of 5,000 restaurants and five recipes. You know, everybody made gumbo. Everybody made etouffee. Everybody, you know, the things were done a certain way. And and I didn't want this. I was I was fascinated by France. You know, France was the, the center of the culinary universe back in my time. I mean, there's a lot of things going on around the world now. Uh, you know, every culture has a great food scene right now. You know, Nordic, Spain, Japan, Mexico. You know, every everybody is embracing their culinary heritage. But back then, France, if you wanted to be an ambitious cook, France is where you went. And for me. That's what I became involved in. You know, I bought, uh, I bought French language cookbooks. Uh, you know, I bought dictionaries. I studied, and everything was geared towards learning as much as I could about French food, and uh, going to work in France. And I did realize that I had to go to culinary school. I, I had a firm belief in that I wanted to, to, to get a foundation. And uh, there wasn't many options back then. Of course. CIA, which Johnson Wales at that time, and I visited both campuses and I made my choice to come here. And uh, I came to Johnson Wales uh, uh, directly out of high school. I knew what I wanted to do. You know, I fell in love with it. Uh, uh, it wasn't a second career. Johnson Wales was very different back then. Uh, I was by far the young, one of the youngest of the student body. There was a lot of people, second career, people who left the military. Uh, people who had run businesses but wanted to take their business to another level. So they came and took a year or two off and to come and take classes here. And uh, But I came here for the express purpose of laying the foundation, uh, learning about the business aspects of it. Uh, I left, went back to New Orleans for a year, but then I moved to New York just to immerse myself uh, in, in these places. I went with the sole, you know, the jobs I took in New York were the, the one criteria was that they had a connection to a place in France that they could possibly send them to And I think at that time, certainly, I think today to some extent, that was the place to be. If you were, French cuisine was the dominant thing happening at the uh, time. Very much curious that's where you went. I think the Chesson go to California for a play was going to be serious. Johnson Wales students over the years, and I know you don't fall 
great student, I know he worked for you. What do you look for when you're hiring, when you're, you know, you get three much star response, you know, your standards are sky high, you have to make sure that you have the right person coming in. What do you look for? I mean, a lot of these guys, a lot of these students are uh, graduating and they're trying to formulate what their career is going to be. And, you know, uh, probably someone's going to be inspired today and they're going to say, you know what, we want to give this guy a couple of email or go knock on the door. What are you looking for? Well, I, you know, I, I like to meet people face to face. You know, it's one thing to send a resume, and, and sometimes that's hard to do. You know, if you're sending, a, if you're sending a resume um, to the East Coast, that's fine. But there has to be, there has to be face to face contact. There has to be uh, an interview. Uh, you can't, you know, culinary schools are great, but they don't teach experience. You know, you have to throw, you know. Schools lay a foundation, but really going out and finding mentors and working for specific people is really where your career and your knowledge and your experience grows by leaps and bounds. <coughs> uh, so what I look for is not necessarily experience, because I can find people who have the experience or perhaps the technical chops. But what we care about in our kitchen are people who care and are looking for a mentor, looking for a situation where uh, they understand their role at the restaurant is to work hard, to learn as much as they can, to give their all and to contribute to our team because we have very much of a collaborative team effort. It takes, it, it takes four or five months in our kitchen just where you start to feel comfortable with our systems that we have in place. So really it's about caring you know, and that's where the face-to-face -face thing comes in. I can show you what I want. I can mentor you, but you have to show me you care and you understand what our concept is, and you have to kind of give up uh, what you're about. I understand what you're about. You're here to gain experience and to learn, perhaps to have my letter of recommendation, your place on the resume, uh, but you have to care. And people who don't understand uh, don't have rudimentary understanding of, of, of fine dining uh, and don't care, then they don't pass. You know, really, you have to care. I can show you what I want. If you don't open yourself, yeah. what's happening? And I, I didn't completely answer your question, you know, uh, about, perhaps you were talking more about ambition, and I, I kind of got off track there. The, you know, we have never cooked we have never cooked for awards. We have never cooked for stars. If you do that, it will be really difficult to do, and it will be really, really painful. You might get it, but you won't do it. You have to stay focused on doing. I have found that when we focus on what we do and how we do it, and we get into this rhythm of really being ourselves, then the accolades and the respect and the stars or reviews, they come naturally. You do what you do, and you do it with passion, and, and you care about it, and you care about quality, then stuff will happen. You know, it, it, but it can't be the supreme value of what you're looking for. Is it only culinary school that you can only eat in a Michelin-star restaurant for the rest of your life? I'm sorry? If you could only eat in a Michelin-star restaurant? If you could only eat in Michelin star restaurants for the rest of your life, or only cook in them, which would you choose? Uh, to cook in them. Absolutely. I mean, Thank you. you know, I mean, cooking, you know, you, you have two, to me, there's two different types of cooking. There is, you know, everyday cooking. And everyday cooking, is, to me, is the most important because you're nourishing yourselves. It usually involves family and friends. It's the conviviality of everybody being together, families being together, gathering around a table. You know, we're kind of losing that a little bit, uh, generation by generation. Uh, I think people are a little bit more aware of it. Times are frantic, it's kind of difficult to do that. But it's the everyday eating, being more aware of how we eat, health, nutrition, well-being, uh, and cooking simply, cooking seasonally. This is all very, very important. This is how I eat 90% of the time anyway. Uh, but then there's special occasions. That's where you're not just eating to nourish yourself, but you're eating because it's a thoughtful and or provocative and or learning experience. Uh, where you're going into someone's house 
you kind of turn yourself over to them, to someone's vision, to someone who's very, very talented and worked hard to create a guest experience. And, you know, I still love doing that. I still, you know, uh, to this day, my, 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 when I was a young cook, I saved my money to go and eat at great restaurants. That's what I did because the, it was a great learning experience. And I still do that. I still have great love for going to see what great cooks and great chefs do. I find it very inspiring. Let me ask another question. When you're conceptualizing a dish, how do you balance the, the consumer or the guest satisfaction with your own cooking pleasure and your suppliers uh, maintaining that contact? How do you, where does the first inspiration come? Is it for yourself or for the guest? Um, well, it actually, you know, not to sound selfish, but I think it's more about us at first. It's being exposed. I think a lot of times when we create dishes, <coughs> It always centers around an ingredient first, an ingredient or a product, seasonality. We tend to build things up. Uh, dishes go through, we've changed a lot in the past five years. Dishes have gone through really rigorous uh, processes where we continually revisit. It's a very collaborative kitchen. It's not all about me. I mean, original ideas uh, might come from me and very well might be uh, Nantucket Bay Scallops are in season November 8th. What are we going to do with them this year? Are we going to do them raw or cooked? You know, and that's how the conversation starts. And it starts with what we did last year, what we want to do this year. Perhaps someone has a new idea in the kitchen about how we go about and do it. But ultimately, when the dish, we're happy with the dish, we're always looking, thinking about the guest experience with it, just like everything else. Um, comfort of the chair. You know, are they going to like the new scallop dish? And I think there's a lot of restaurants out there nowadays that, you know, where it's about the chef and about their vision and things are provocative. Maybe they don't even taste good, but it's, you know, where creativity is a supreme value. But, and it might be interesting, but would you go back? And, you know, there might have been a phase in my life where I was kind of like that, but nowadays it's really about the guests. You know, we talk about in lineup every day when we, talk about our service during the course of the day. We're going to talk about who's coming in, the dishes that are on the menu, dietary restrictions, which become a big part of what we talk about every day. Um, we ask, are people happy? What is the feedback from the guests about the dish? Because to me, great fine dining is food that is shares a vision of the chef. It exhibits characteristics of the place that it is at. It is thoughtful, perhaps provocative, but it gives the guests pleasure. It has to be there. Uh, and I might be old fashioned. You know. Thank you. So I'm sitting in your restaurant, it's midnight. I had one of the most emotional dishes I've ever eaten. Your hands tense them on a plate. Love Apple Farms salad and composed items presented. I was with Rob Mancuso, the chef at the Bohemian Club. And around midnight, you were very gracious as you took your leave after chatting with us. And uh, you departed. And we sat for another hour and 40 minutes alone <laughs> from one in the morning till about two. And when we left, this question is really about the work. We uh, walked out stunned, overwhelmed by emotion, top three meals of my life. I took my camera and held it up over your kitchen window, you know, when you're leaving and took a picture, and at two in the morning, you were in there laminating dough. What is it like? What's the work like? Because it struck us that you probably had been there since nine or 10 a.m. And at two in the morning, you're laminating dough for the next day. This has to be an extraordinary amount of work. Uh, it's a lot of work, but, um, you know, I, like I said, I, I enjoy going to work every day. This is a terrible, terrible industry to be in if you don't like it. You know, it will it will beat you down mentally and physically. You have to love it. You have to, to really be inspired by it and be inspired by what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I love going to work every day. And uh, I, I'll admit it gets harder and harder the older I get. Um, and, you know, I backed off on a lot of things that I used to do just because it's becoming more physically demanding for me to do it. But my role at the restaurant is it grows in other ways as well. Um, and I, I 
tell people this, people don't believe me, but I, I, I sincerely mean it, is the restaurant closes and I leave the business the day that I don't want to go to work anymore. It's, it's, that was the battery dying. <laughs> Is that better? No? Try this there. Um, the, day, the day I don't like going to work and, and cooking and taking care of guests, the day I leave the business. I, I, I feel very strongly about that. I have a lot of people say, hey, I don't believe you. Now, watch. Watch what happens. So you mentioned one of the best meals in your life taking place in San Rafa, and I can think of a couple in my experience too that just sort of changed the way you think about food. Was there one for you, David? Yeah, there's several. There's several. Uh, um, I had um, uh, a meal in France when I was a young cook. I went over, I was stogging, I was 23, I was working in France. And of course, I was 22 years old and I knew everything. You know, I knew I was the best wine cook in the world at 22, at least in my own mind. And, uh, and uh, working at this restaurant, and uh, I had saved money to eat at uh, uh, places around the area. I was in Burgundy, uh, saved my money to eat at some three-star places. And I went to this one restaurant. Uh, it was called Alain Chapelle. He's no longer with us. He, he, passed, he passed away. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, and I remember, you know, back then, it was my first experience with a restaurant that, you know, it was a French restaurant, it was fine dining, but it wasn't grandiose, it wasn't fancy, it was, it was not about the crystal and the tablecloths, it was a place in the country, it had three Michelin stars, um, but it was about the food, and I remember driving in this town and not finding the restaurant and then realizing it was this driveway and door in this wall and going in and it was it was it was a house it was someone's house and there was a terrace and I remember sitting out underneath the terrace and they poured us a glass of wine and there was birds singing in the trees and you know they, they gave I remember I remember saying oh I want to do this one day because they gave me the menu outdoors and we decided what we wanted, the whole thing. We sat out there for another 45 minutes, an hour, enjoying ourselves before going to the table. And then you never saw a menu again. You really never interacted with the staff anymore. All of a sudden, it became like it was an experience in someone's home. And uh, it was a meal that uh, it, it kind of dumbfounded me. It was very, very simple. Uh, the food was from the garden there. Uh, I know, I, simple's the wrong word. It was, it was a real complex simplicity. But I remember the flavors of everything. Sauces were like, it was food that was 20 years ahead of its time. Uh, the quality of the products were exceptional. They sang uh, the quality of the products. And I remember taking the, leaving and taking the train going and going back to my room. I lived in the attic in the hotel or the restaurant I was working at. And, and I just remember like sitting there and realizing that I knew nothing about food that I was heading in completely the wrong direction. I didn't want to do what I was doing anymore. I didn't want to cook these tr uh, classic French dishes. I didn't want to work and spend three days making a sauce. Uh, the whole idea of things were trappings. And, and I, it was the first time I was exposed to really what was essential and something spoke to me. And I, I remember getting very emotional about it and thinking, you know, I'm screwing up here. I'm, I'm heading in the, this is not what I want to do. All of a sudden, this is not what I want to do. I want to do what he's doing. I want to figure out what he's doing. And uh, it was then, it was that meal also I realized that, you know, what they do in France, maybe we can't do in the United States because, you know, they had this great grand tradition of fine dining and, and expensive products and, and all this. This was all of a sudden was a meal like, this is something that we can do in the United States. This is like, he doesn't care about the traffic. I mean, he, this, what he's doing can only exist from this one guy in this one place. It was a true sense of place. Um, uh, and to me, that was, it still is like the greatest meal I ever had in my life. And The tenets that I learned from that meal is what kind of drives me today. I mean, 
you know, what we do at Man Race is, is everything, everything we do, whether it's choosing a chair or a painting hanging on a wall or a new source for oysters, is it not only reflective of who we are, but where we are. Central Coast of California, foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains on the Pacific Ocean. You know, can you pick this up and put it in New York or Providence, Barcelona, London? It wouldn't matter. Does it speak of where we are? And that's where that at home. And to me, that's very, very important. I think that first time when, some, when, you, when you go to a restaurant, you taste something that tastes exactly the way it's supposed to taste, and maybe more, mm -hmm. without masking your word, is revelatory. And that, for me, that was a West Coast experience. Well, that's the magic. That's 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 the, what when people, you know, when every, when everything becomes the sum of. The sum is greater than what you're putting into it, the parts that you're putting into it. That's the magic. That is something that a computer can't do. That's something that technicians can't do. That is something that people who are really passionate about food, that's what, what they can achieve. And to me, that's what excites me. Mm -hmm. That's still what excites me about it. Awesome. Nick, is there a question? Can you speak up, please? Yeah, sure. Why don't you stand up and give us a shout out? <laughs> I'm sorry? Two or four years. I went for two years. I went uh, 1980 and Uh Difficult to say. The experience now, it's like I came back for the first time a year and a half ago, and it's astonishing the changes that have taken place here at the, at the school. Um, uh, I was, I had the opportunity to continue at that time. It was two years of culinary and then two years of business if you wanted to complete for four years. But, uh, I, I thought about it, but I decided that I wanted to start working and I wanted to start, uh, gaining experience and finding mentors. The great thing about mentors is, is you can learn two things. You can learn how to do things and you can learn how not to do things. And sometimes that's even a more important lesson. Negative learning is very, very important. There's a question in the back. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Joel, I was just kind of wondering, um, is there any way to use your influence and serve like a larger community? Um, we are involved in, you know, some hunger programs. Uh, there are some charities that, um, uh, that are personally dear to me, you know, for, for whatever reason that uh, we contribute to. Some, you know, that the public knows about and some that don't. Um, I have been afforded the great opportunity with the success of the restaurant to have a chance to travel a lot, uh, do events, do food congresses, and I've done a lot of them in the past six or seven years, but I'm kind of backing off on them a little bit. Um, I like being closer to home, but the criteria for traveling nowadays is is it usually has to be for a charity or for something I really believe in as opposed to just having a chance to travel and stuff. So we do a lot to, to raise money for, for various events and causes that we deem worthy, yes. I, I, think it's, I think it's important that you have to give back at some point in time. Yeah. Uh, my question is, so what kind of experience do you do you want your customers to have when you walk into the restaurant? Um, well, I, I want them to uh, I want them to be happy. That's what's really important. When they leave, it, it really comes. We're not a cheap restaurant. Uh, it, it, it's it's fairly expensive experience. But when people leave the restaurant, I want them to think that was really great. And even though it was a lot of money, I would go back if given an opportunity. Uh, because remember we talked about uh, the customer's always right and the customer's perception being always right. If their perception of value is that it was really, really great and that they would come back, then I think uh, uh, we've done our job. Because it's one thing to cook, but it's another thing to cook for no customers. It's really great to have people, you know, you know, Cynically, from a business aspect, you know, you, you need guests, and 
for us being in Los Gatos, which is away from a major urban area, um, repeat customers is uh, was a very, very important part of uh, what we did. We need people to come back. People to like it so much that they wanted to come back. So that's one reason why we place such an emphasis on customer satisfaction. Does that answer your question? No? Okay. No. <laughs> Because I do, I want to answer your question. Um, just regarding your uh, attention to detail, saying how you pay attention to the uh, comfiness of your chairs, the seasonalness of the food. Um, now being three Michelin stars, what does the word perfection mean to you, and does it change your perception of how how you um, you cook your food and just the food in general? Um. No, I don't think it's, you know, you know, God is in the details, but, you know, so is the devil. You know, you, you have to revisit everything. And a lot of times we don't have the time to do it, you know, in our, in our busy work day. Um, you know, a little over two years ago, the, the restaurant caught fire and it, 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 the half of it was destroyed. So it was closed for over half a year and we had to rebuild the restaurant and it was a really painful experience but something really great came out of it uh, first of all everybody came back all the employees came back but and we kept all the managers working and we met every day we worked we worked full weeks even when the restaurant was closed uh during the construction period and one of the projects that we did was when we come back we're going to be an even better restaurant and we had the opportunity to walk through the entire guest experience from the parking and finding the place, walking up the pathway, what do they see, what is their perception of the restaurant from the pathway, how do we want to rebuild it, from opening the door, the greeting at the door, all the way through you know, the ambiance, the service, the food, to when they ask for their check, and then we say goodbye to them leaving. And a lot of times when we're working our days, we don't have a, lot, a great opportunity to sit down and analyze all that stuff. So the great thing about being closed from the fire is we had a chance to revisit all that. And I think we put some systems in place about how we evaluate things that we do and realizing the importance of it is very, very important. So uh, yes, it is a, it's a very, very important part of what we do. Um, I would say, the one thing that we agreed upon, and I don't take full credit for this, but we talked about in the dining room and the cooks who encounter guests that two things have to happen when you make contact with the guests. And if you, you don't do it, you don't work for us anymore. And that is you make eye contact with the guests always. If there's any kind of interaction whatsoever, you look them in the eye. And when you smile, it's a genuine smile. Now you all know what a fake smile is. We've all experienced <laughs> fake smiles, whether it's a Starbucks or a restaurant. You know, people, you know, they, you know it's, it's part of their job and they smile. And we all know when it's fake. So we offer genuine smiles and eye contact. And if you don't do that, you don't work for us. And that goes a long way towards what you were talking about here about you know a guest satisfaction coming back people feel that people feel the genuineness about it so if they're spending if they're spending ten dollars for a meal or four hundred dollars for a meal uh, it, it plays a factor it's part of that customer's perception that we're talking about we have uh, one last question from the audience okay. welcome chef my name is Kathy Harney and Hi, Kathy. I have the honor of setting at your restaurant with being Belladon and Chancellor Golden, my husband, from three years ago now, I believe it was. Um, I want to commend you, but after leaving the restaurant that night and having a phenomenal experience, I remember thinking, who is this person behind the chef coat? And um, I just picked up a copy of your book and I've had a chance to peruse it. And I'd like to congratulate you on the book. I think it provides some wonderful insight into your leadership philosophy, your collaborative spirit in the kitchen, 
and um, I thought that you know, if you could talk a little bit about your own inspirations, particularly uh, with the uh, Fruit of Giraffe or Africa of Giraffe, it seems as though that wasn't a place that you were considering, and um, it was certainly on your path in this field. It sounds, from what you're saying today, as though much of the inspiration you took from that experience has continued in your own investment. Of course. Um, <coughs> you, know, uh, you know, chef's only as good as the people who work for him. You know, that's, that's a big part of it. It's, uh, regardless of what people say, it, it's always a collaborative effort, uh, which is why a, a hiring practice, uh, hiring practice becomes so important, and especially in you know, human resources and how things, and, 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 and labor laws right now. It's, it's difficult to, it's much easier to fire someone 25 years ago than it is now. And uh, so it's really important that you make the right decisions about who you work with. Now, you know, we talked about, uh, gosh, I sound like such an old man, but you know, in the 1980s when uh, I came back from France and I'm looking to work in these French restaurants in New York City and I was lucky enough to have my resume accepted at the Quilted. And going in, uh, you talked about at the beginning about uh, how revolutionary that restaurant was. Uh, the Quilted Giraffe was, you know, an American restaurant in a sea of French restaurants. It was the first, really, one that you know the general public was aware of. Uh, when it was an American fine dining restaurant, unapologetically American, openly distinct to the whole French model, and he was hated in many circles for it. He was, you know, he's made fun of. Uh, he was self-taught. He didn't go through the rigors of, uh, of French classical training. But when I walked in and I did my trail there, the first night I was looking at the food, and I was like, "This is the food that I had at Lunch of Hell. This is food that has the spirit of this meal that changed my life." They didn't care. There was no rules. They were just cooking great food, great ingredients. They had a farm in upstate, Poughkeepsie. Newports where they, they they work for the weekends. They were bringing things down and they were cooking the food that they liked to cook, but they were doing it in an uncompromising uh, way. And and because he was self-taught, he wasn't trapped in the dog the dogmatic nature of the, the this French hierarchical system. He relied on the collaborative spirit of these people that were working in the kitchen. And, you know, Sheikh Nice was a lot like that, too, on the other coast at that time. You know, Alice wasn't a trained chef. You know, she was she was a thinker, and, and she was an intellectualizer, and that's what Barry was, too. And Barry would say things. I mean, you know, here I am coming back from France, and Barry would say things like, oh, let's make a Bernay sauce, but, you know, why don't we make it with duck fat? And, you know, I think, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. Well, why can't we do that? Because that's not how they do it. And, you know, his, his thinking was, I don't care. I don't care. And of course, that doesn't sound like anything nowadays. But back then, that was that was unheard of. People did not talk like that. You know, Bernays, you know, you you ask you ask a French chef to make a Bernays sauce. You ask a hundred chefs, French chefs, to make a Bernays sauce. You'll get a hundred examples of the exact same sauce. That's part of one of the great things about France, but it's also one of the lousy things about France, too. So I think there was a huge shift there from, say, uh, recipe-focused <coughs> cooking to ingredient-focused cooking. And I think that really was one of the big shifts in the 80s. People really looked at ingredients as opposed to this you know, standard repertoire formula that you were seeking to do over and over again. Yeah. But here were people looking at what was coming to the board for the first time and trying to source it in a way that allowed her to express something else. Yeah, I mean, Barry, uh, you know, the time to quilt it was, it was like we, we, it was the first time that we explored ingredients in creating a dish. It wasn't like this dish with this sauce, this is how it's done. It was more like, wow, we got these great apples. We got these four bushels of apples that came in. They were dry farmed, different varieties. <coughs> People haven't seen it, and you go, what are we going to do with them? Mm -hmm. And the ideas came from the product as opposed to the dish. And that was eye-opening. To me, that made sense to this eye-opening experience that I had. Uh, we were well-treated there, uh, well-respected. 
It was a kitchen that had a ton of women in the kitchen, which was revolutionary at that time. Um, we closed for a vacation, Mike, uh, we closed for a couple weeks for a vacation, and <coughs> Harry and his wife and his family went to Japan, uh, and he came back a changed person. <coughs> the menu changed, cooking time shortened, he bought tons of money on plates that weren't white, he actually used plates that weren't white, which was another revolutionary thing. Uh, you know, uh, he brought back these plates, and cooking with less fat, cooking food that was colorful and shortened cooking times and emphasis on freshness and seasonality and this was a you know this was uh, a tremendous uh, had a tremendous influence on me and everybody else on the kitchen as well. Fabulous. Uh, I think we are just about out of time. Is that correct, uh, Chef? Okay, one more question. One more question then for the chef? The chef? No. Uh, where is it? Okay, good. Hi Jeff, my name is Blade. Um, do you think that it's important for students to seek a national experience? Like you said, uh, French training is a little, I don't want to say outdated, but uh, I think too, the States we do have a lot of um, chefs that are trying to do different things and they can keep that fresh. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I think, well, you know, it's it's all about finding a mentor. It's all about going and finding someone where you feel you're going to learn and increase your, your experience and your and your knowledge that will aid you in your professional career, whatever your goal may be. Is it going to, you know, do you want to be, do you want to have your own restaurants? Mm -hmm. So it, make the decision based on what you would like to accomplish. And the person doesn't necessarily have to be overseas. They can be. But you, you can find mentors anywhere. You know, it's um, uh, going overseas is fun. It's adventurous. Uh, you have a chance to live in a foreign country, which is great. And usually, when you're younger and life is a lot simpler, you know, it's the best time to do it. Um, uh, it helps to know the language. You know, if you really want to to uh, grasp as much as you can from it, it's great to understand everything that's going on around you as well. Uh, international experience is great, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be so. Would you go to France to learn Not much. I took lessons. Um, uh, I learned my French translating French cookbooks with a dictionary. Kind of laying around. That's, that's, that's how it happened. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, I, I see we are getting close to the uh, amount of time. Think about uh, David Kinch and uh, um, from Pirates and Pyro, the three mission and spark has been quite a an adventure and a journey. Uh, do you have any final thoughts for our students? Uh, the budding chef entrepreneur of the 2020s. Uh, I mean, it's... Uh, don't open the Los Gatos. <laughs> no, I mean, um, you know, it's... I... There's nothing I... Nothing I would do differently. I mean, I don't have many regrets. I. I, this has been, it's been a really, I, I felt I have worked enough for two lifetimes, mm -hmm. but I don't regret a second of it. It's, I've gotten tremendous amounts of pleasure. I've met many amazing people. Uh, you know, I, one of the things I wanted to do when I went into the business was to travel and to see the world. I've been afforded that opportunity. I feel very, very lucky about that. Um, I've eaten very well. I've never starved. Um, and you know all, all, the, all the things that I get great pleasure about uh, meeting people, working with people, working with my hands, and being creative—it's all been satisfied by the industry. I, I certainly have no regrets. Wonderful. Thank you very much.
after reading his book, spending time in the restaurant, um, I got to pop in and say hello, and I also got to have a meal with uh, Chancellor Rowan and First Lady Harmony, and it was uh, life-changing, as Dr. Griffin said. It really, really was. Um, so I certainly uh, want to thank um, Chef for that, and um, it takes a village. Chef is here. To, you want a question over here, do you do um, philanthropic reach out? Do you do things to change? He is indeed here to make a huge change. He's a guest chef um, for tomorrow night's dinner for our Epicurean Society, and we'll be um, raising money for scholarship for Johnson and Susan for future students to come here and sit exactly where you're sitting right now. So um, again, we're uh, to, to travel across the country to be here with us. Uh, we couldn't be more happy and more more proud of that. And um, we do have people that are helping us, helping along with that. One in particular um, company that's donating our plates. Who Chef Kim actually has a line of plates with other companies. Steel Lake you probably have seen their china and their glassware around school. We certainly use it here. Um, so, with a little surprise, I guess I want to introduce uh, Kim uh, Madienzo, if I said that correctly. She's going to just touch a little bit about um, a little fun thing we're going to do here. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank, hello, Jeff. How are you? Thank you for having me. Um, Steelite really, really loves our relationship that we have with Johnson & Wales. We've been working with you for over 11 years, and I've been to the campus making it. This is my fifth visit. So um, excited to be here, excited to be able to provide the dinnerware for tomorrow night. And um, when I found out that Chef Kinch was going to be here and he was going to be cooking at the dinner, I was thinking, how can we incorporate, because we, we basically design, manufacture, and supply tabletop ware, which is chinaware, flatware, and glassware, specifically made for the hospitality industry. And um, only one time have we collaborated with a chef, and it was Chef Kinch and came up with one of our very unique lines, which is called Kodo. So I really wanted you guys to have an, an opportunity to experience it. So we decided to do a giveaway and select three students that would get a set of Kodo to take home. I brought one, a piece from my house, because I use it. And um, it really is beautiful. It um, has a, like, a really beautiful glaze, black texture with a red iron oxide. And it really is absolutely gorgeous and frames food beautifully. Um, and again, this was a collaboration with Chef Kinch. So how we decided to do this is if you check underneath your seat and you see a Steelite logo, you are the winner. And just see me afterwards and get my business card and we'll be mailing you the And uh, who is that? Bring, bring the phone.